Beloved church, please pray with me. Spirit of God, breathe in each of us that we might receive the words that you have for us and be nourished by them. Amen. When I was about 13 years old, two of my good friends invited me to go sailing with them. We were vacationing on a small lake, and we went sailing all the time with one of our neighbors. He would load up his large wooden boat with about a dozen kids and teenagers and take us out for a slow trip, the heavy boat riding low in the water. But this time, my friends were planning to ask this neighbor if we could borrow his smaller boat so just the three of us could go sailing. I agreed because both of my friends had taken sailing lessons. It felt safe. We had life vests. We were all good swimmers. But then, way out from shore, in the middle of the lake, one of my friends got bored and decided to jump overboard and hold on to a rope tied to the back of the boat so that she could get towed along. Again, this is something we did pretty regularly, but with an adult at the helm. There was no adult in this boat. Soon after, my other friend also jumped overboard to hang on to a rope on the back of the boat. Remember, I was the one who had not had sailing lessons. And now, I was the only person left in the boat. Thirteen-year-olds, it turns out, do not always make wonderful decisions. My main goal was not to capsize our neighbor's boat. So I positioned the rudder so that not a lot of wind was in the sail. The boat was not moving quickly. We weren't going to tip over. Then I tried to convince my friends to climb back in the boat while they tried to convince me to move the boat as quickly as I could so that they could get towed behind it. At one point, the wind did shift direction and catch the sail, and I had to scramble to hold things steady and not get hit by the boom as it came swinging by. Another sailboat with a couple of adults we knew came close enough that we could see them. They called out to see if we were okay. And before I could ask for help, my friends both yelled back that they were fine. And the adults sailed away. One of my friends in the water waved at the boat as it sailed away and lost her grip on the rope. So now she was moving away from us as our boat kept moving with the wind. I was horrified. She was bobbing in the water laughing. I honestly don't remember how we got back to shore. I think I convinced the remaining friend to get back in the boat so she could help me turn the sailboat around and go pick up our friend. What I do remember is fumbling around, realizing that the wind was absolutely not going to cooperate with us. We had to figure out how to cooperate with the wind. The wind blows where it will. I imagine that Nicodemus in our passage from this morning felt a little bit like I did on that boat. Alone, fumbling for the tools to cope with a situation that was out of his control. Maybe he sought Jesus out in the middle of the night, hoping Jesus would have tools to help him get his bearings and return to a safe harbor. But Jesus doesn't really do that. Instead, Jesus seems to reinforce that Nicodemus is not in control. The wind blows where it will. In this encounter, Nicodemus is in the midst of deconstruction. He's been paying close attention to Jesus, and on the one hand, 
Jesus seems to be contradicting a lot of the belief system Nicodemus was raised in. On the other hand, Jesus is legitimately changing people's lives for the better, and Nicodemus can't ignore that. He's been raised to believe that someone with that kind of transformative power must be from God. But how can someone from God be contradicting all of these traditions that are supposedly also from God? Deconstruction is a catchphrase that a lot of formerly evangelical folks use to describe the process of examining and ultimately often disagreeing with much of what, much of the dogma that we were raised with. Some of us grew up in traditions that taught us to believe very specific things about who God is, who Jesus is, what the Bible is, how to read it, how to live our lives. Because all of those beliefs were given to us as a packaged set, it can be frightening when you realize that one part of that doesn't fit, doesn't fit with what you've actually experienced in life. When one piece of the package doesn't hold up anymore, it can feel like the whole belief system is going to fall apart. And sometimes it does. It can feel like losing your anchor, losing the one thing that connected you confidently to truth. And even if you didn't grow up in a rigid faith tradition, you might still identify with this process of deconstruction. Maybe your deconstruction process has been about a different kind of belief system. Maybe you've had to deconstruct some of what you have believed about America as you have learned parts of our nation's history that were glossed over in your formal education. Maybe you've deconstructed the gender roles that you watched your parents model, or the discipline style that you were raised with. Deconstruction is different from just learning something new. Deconstruction is when new information causes us to question the assumptions that we have been carrying around assumptions that are at the center of our worldview or identity. I don't know what Nicodemus was looking for from Jesus. And I don't know if Nicodemus got what he was looking for in this late night conversation. Jesus's response affirms that deconstruction is necessary for him or perhaps inevitable. The metaphor that Jesus keeps using, the metaphor about birth and being born again, he comes at it from so many different directions. And it's a metaphor about a shifted perspective, seeing the world through new eyes. Jesus invites Nicodemus to notice that the wind blows in ways that we cannot control. We don't know where it comes from or where it will go. We can only hear the sound of it moving in our midst. It's the same with people who have been born of the Spirit, Jesus says. People who see the world with fresh eyes You might not understand where they are coming from or where they are going, but you can hear them making a racket as they blow through the neighborhood. The wind blows where it will. Nicodemus came to Jesus in secret, under the cover of darkness, because deconstruction is scary. And sometimes, when the Spirit of God is calling us outside of the traditions we have received, 
We have a lot to lose. When I was ordained in the Presbyterian Church in 2006, the denomination did not allow people who were in same gender relationships to become pastors. It was actually a pretty new rule, one introduced in the 1990s, but the conservative leaders who defended this restriction made it seem as if it was a hard and fast rule straight from the Bible that could never possibly be questioned. By the time I became a pastor, I was uncomfortable with that rule. But I was a 26-year-old woman, the first installed woman pastor in 185 years of history at the small rural congregation where I served. I didn't want to rock the boat more than I did just by being myself in that pulpit. My spouse and I were making more and more friends who were gay and lesbian. I had felt that tug of deconstruction, that dissonance in which the real life experience of people I loved and respected did not match up with what I was taught to believe about God. One of my mentors was a gay chaplain and he was so good at pastoral care. I couldn't imagine that his ministry was somehow outside of God's will just because he was married to a man. And we had a seminary classmate who, after years of trying to be straight, finally started dating a woman. And the difference in her mental and physical health was startling. Being true to her sexual orientation was so obviously better for her that I could no longer believe that God would ask her to do otherwise. I wanted the church to change, and I wanted my LGBTQ friends to know that God loved them. I could hear the winds of change, and I knew that sound was the Spirit of God, but I also kind of hoped that I could follow the Spirit quietly, quietly enough to not put my job on the line. My job was the one with benefits. So I can relate to Nicodemus's fear. But something about Jesus's words to him that night were an irresistible invitation. At the end of the Gospel of John, we meet Nicodemus again, this time at Jesus's grave. He is one of the people who helps the disciples bury Jesus' body. Nicodemus may have been frightened of the Spirit's movement at first, but he recognizes the people Jesus talked about, people moving like the wind, and he joins them. One of the scariest things for those of us who have been through a deconstruction process is feeling unmoored. How do we know if we're headed in the right direction? If the old traditions are failing us or if the truths we have held as self-evident appear to be incomplete or flawed, how do we know what is true? What is right? What is good? How do we know that we are not just drifting into oceans of chaos further and further from the God we are meant to serve? We stand in a tradition that embraces a living God. In the UCC, tradition does not bind us to one way of understanding God or the Bible. Our tradition gives us the tools we need to listen to and follow a God who is still speaking. So what are those tools? We can see one of them in this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. When Nicodemus asks, how can these things be? How can this disorienting process of being born anew be necessary? 
Jesus says, we have been telling you about what we know and testifying about what we have seen and you have not received our testimony. If we tell you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe us when we tell you about heavenly things? One way we learn to listen to God's Spirit is by listening intently to the experiences of fellow human beings. Every time we listen to a young person who says, I don't feel like a girl or a boy. I don't fit in that binary. We have the option to believe them and to discover God's spirit doing something we never dreamed possible. Every time a community member says the criminal justice system does more harm in their neighborhood than good, we have an opportunity to believe them and to discover God calling us to works of justice that we did not know were necessary. The truth of the matter is that God exists in the real world, not in any of the boxes we construct to try to make sense of the world. The closer we get to the real world, in all its messy complexity, the closer we get to God. And the best way to get closer to the nuance and tension and messiness of the world, the best way to deconstruct those boxes, is to get closer to people with different experiences from our own. The more we really listen to others, the more we begin to know about the parts of reality we have not yet experienced. And when we do that, we are closer than ever to the Spirit of God. The Spirit blows where it will. I only found the courage to be an outspoken advocate for the LGBTQ folks in the church after really listening to and believing the stories of people who had been hurt by the church. What I heard them saying was, silence is not enough. Private support is not enough when the only Christians we hear in the public are ones condemning us. It doesn't really matter that different Christians exist. They aren't helping, and that hurts too. And then, once I got better at listening to those people whose experiences were different from my own, then I was able to hear the rushing wind of the Spirit offering words to speak, actions to take. And ultimately, that Spirit blew apart my understanding of myself and my own sexual orientation. Deconstruction is scary. It can cut to the core of who we are. But it is also liberating. Knowing our world and knowing ourselves with more clarity, that is freedom. The spirit blows where it will. If we, as a species, have learned one thing in the last year, it is that we cannot predict or control the future. The wind 
will not cooperate with us. We must learn how to cope with that. Maybe we will hunker down, pull in the sails, and focus on not capsizing. When our lives are in danger, that is the best response. But friends, not every wind is a life-threatening gale. The winds of change can also draw us closer to God, closer to one another, further along the journey of faith. The Spirit moves like wind, and so do God's people. The wind blows where it will, and I I'm so glad to be in this boat with you. Amen.